good evening. Welcome to Intentional Living. We're glad that you join us tonight, this Wednesday night, February the 24th, and I hope you've been enjoying our series entitled The End, a study on the book of Revelation. Well, we're so glad you're here. And let me remind you just a couple of things for this coming week. Again, our service for Sunday will be 9, 15, and 10, 30. Uh, children's ministries, kindergarten through grade five will be going, actually nursery, sorry, nursery through grade five will be continuing this coming week during the 1030 service only. So just make note of that this coming Sunday, uh, again, uh, 9, 15, 10, 30, and all children's ministries from nursery all the way to uh, grade five will be uh, in operation this coming Sunday. We got some special news we'll be announcing to you uh, in the next day or two, and especially this weekend regarding uh, midweek services on Wednesday night. So uh, be uh, tuning in, be watching for those announcements by email or on uh, Facebook, and we'll definitely be giving you all the details this coming Sunday. Well, we're glad you're here. Let's go ahead and dive into <clears throat> the scriptures tonight. We'll be in Revelation chapter 6 and 7. Um, sorry, Revelation 7 and 8. Uh, it's been a wild and crazy couple of days here, so I may be a little scatterbrained tonight. Uh, trying to get all this study in with everything we've been through uh, this week in our community. But uh, Revelation 7 and 8 tonight. A parenthesis. You ever use parentheses when you're writing? We all do. When we were in school, we would use a parenthesis. We use parentheses to enclose information that clarifies or is used as uh, a, a side item. Okay, Parentheses are used to enclose incidental or extra information. The dictionary says, such as a passing comment or a minor, minor example or addition or brief explanation. Um, for example, he answered parentheses after taking five minutes to think, close parentheses, that he did not understand the question. Uh, you might say something like this. The guy, the, the man gave a donation to the charity, comma, $500 uh, or parentheses, $500. So those parentheses uh, enclose additional information. You know, now, right in the middle of where we are, right in the middle of these seven seals, we finished seal six and in chapter six, and now we're moving to Revelation seven and John, uh, well, actually God, through the Holy Spirit, who um, told John what to say. And now John takes a, a pause here. We've got a, a parenthesis right here. And I would call chapter 7 and part of chapter 8 a parenthesis, um, where we've got some additional sideline information. Doesn't mean it's less important information. The man who gave to the charity $500 is the significant part of that. So it just gives more detailed information. So we see this, some scholars call it a, call it a pause. Some uh, scholars call it God's parentheses. And, but here we're about to encounter the ultimate and inevitable collision between holiness and iniquity, as John Phillips would state it. So let's look tonight uh, in Revelation chapter 7. Now, we're going to take each segment of Scripture as we come to it. I'm not going to read the whole portion of Scripture at the beginning. But have your Bibles ready. Tonight, I've entitled tonight's message, A Parenthesis in the Middle of Pandemonium. If you've downloaded the sermon sheet for tonight, we're looking at event number 8 in the 50 final events in history. And we've now come to this parenthesis or a pause. And John begins to turn um, to talk solely about God's chosen people. Who is that? You got it. That's Israel. We're going to see that specifically in chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 really is divided perfectly into two separate segments. Verses 1 through 8 talk specifically about the 144,000 Jews. When we get to verses 9 through 17, uh, John's going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the great multitudes 
from the tribulation. So really divided, really equally in what John, uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking about. So God is about to tell us in advance how he will seal and take care of his chosen people while at the same time sealing and strengthening others before the time of judgment. So let's dive in here and look at these scriptures. Look with me now at Revelation 7. Let's begin reading in verse 1 through 8. After this, that's going to be significant again. After this, that is suggesting that these events are sequential. Okay, you're going to see that a couple of times. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or in any tree. Then I saw another angel rise up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those were sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, then we're going to stop right there at the end of verse 4. Verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Give all the tribes of Israel by name and the number that God saved in those 144,000. Now, how many tribes of Israel? 12, 12 tribes. The Bible says specifically uh, in verses 5 through 8, 12,000 from each tribe, name by name, called specifically. You see them right there from Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishkar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. The 12 tribes of Israel, each one called out by name. And then 12,000 from each tribe sealed. Now, the Bible talks about this, this great pause or a stillness among the earth. Now, when we get to verse 4, John names all the tribes of Israel and reveals 12,000 from each tribe will be saved. Now, just quickly do the math. It's not hard. 12,000 times 12 equals what I'm calling here in point number one, the signature sealed salvation of the Jews. The signature sealed salvation of the Jews. Now, let's go back quickly. 12 tribes times 12,000 people equals 144,000 Jews that the Bible states without exception. And there's no room for for debate on this part of Revelation, that the 144,000 Jews will be saved according to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, 3 and 4. So these people will be saved. Verse uh, 4 goes on to say, 144,000 sealed from every nation of the sons of Israel. You've heard me quote several times in these several weeks. John Phillips says this. Let me read this to you. Pay close attention. A stillness will descend on human affairs on earth. Okay, This scene is taking place at this moment on earth. The world's politicians no doubt will pride themselves that their diplomacy and astuteness have brought about this tranquility. That's a lie. The sudden peace, however, will be none of man's doing but God's. It is in reality just a law between the storms. You're going to see as we unfold these two chapters this evening that the day of reckoning is coming. And God is now setting it up in the first part of chapter 7 here as we address these 144,000 that they are going to be sealed, saved, and protected before that day of reckoning. Now, the sudden stillness must take place so that the 144,000 can be sealed or saved, whichever word you want to use there. Now, understand this. I fully believe this. 
God would not allow, or God will not allow the great tribulation to take place until he has the significant or the signature seal of salvation on his chosen people, Israel. So why I was so emphatic on this past Sunday that we need to stick with Israel because they're God's chosen people. And this part of Revelation chapter 7 reiterates that and emphasizes it and points straight to it that these 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe, making up the 144,000 of God's signature salvation to these Jews. He's going to save his people. So we see there point number one, the signature salvation of the Jews. Let's look at point number two. The standing saints at the throne. We get this from verses 9 through 17 of chapter 7. Let's quickly look at that scripture. <clears throat> look with me, verse 9. After this, I looked, John speaking, there was a vast multitude from every nation. Now the scene switches to heaven now. He was referring to things on earth. Now he's referring to heaven. Every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and unto the Lamb. What a great statement of worship. I love that song that we sing here in our church, Salvation Belongs to Our God. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, <clears throat> Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then, well, let's pause here. I think this is a good place to pause without reading too much scripture for you to grasp at this one time. But here we have, first of all, we had the signature salvation of the, of the Jews is what I called it. Then secondly, I've, I've categorized point number two as the standing saints at the throne. John again bring, begins this next section by using the words after this. Again, pointing to a sequential order, that these things are in order after this, after this, after this. So now let's break this down a little bit. This The standing saints, let, let, let's look at these passages. Verse 9 gives us a lot of detail. It gives us their number, or at least a reference to it, their number, a vast multitude. Okay, so Chris, you said it's going to give a number, but it doesn't really give, no, it doesn't give a specific number, but it tells us about the number. It's a vast number. It's referring to, now, to the Gentiles, okay, verses 1 through 8, talking about who? 144,000 Jews. Now, John switches gears a little bit. This vast multitude is referring to the Gentiles who have been saved during the tribulation. So, understand that. First, we were talking about the Jews, 144,000. Now, we believe the revival, the Bible is referring to the Gentiles that were being saved. A vast multitude. How many is a vast multitude? Verse 9 says it was countless. Too many. It's going to be too many to count. So there, we have the number that is described. Now, let's talk about another point. Their nationality. Their nationality. Notice, there will be no racism or prejudices in heaven. Let me say that again. There will be no racism and prejudice in heaven. It says in the Bible, from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, and every language. Not a single tribe or tongue will go missing. Every nationality where the gospel has been taken will be represented there. But it says every. That's why we have as an obligation right now today to help get the gospel to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, meaning every language, and every people. We have that obligation and that responsibility as believers. That's why I am so emphatic about missions 
in our church. That's why we support missions so heavily. That's why we send teams. That's why we go. That's why we support it with our finances over and over. And we will continue to do that. So we see their number, their nationality. Now, let's talk about their nature. We see that in verses 9 through 12. These multitudes are doing what? What's their nature? Okay, let's talk about that. We just read it. They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So they're standing there, worshiping, standing before the throne of God. And it says before the Lamb. Then what else about their nature? They're robed in white. Now, a question popped up in my mind. Why white robes? Why are they adorned in these white robes? Why not blue shirts? Well, I think there's some reason behind that. What does white always represent? That's right, purity. Purity. Why does a bride walk down the aisle with a white wedding dress? It's supposed to represent her purity and waiting for that groom. White represents purity. You know, you think about this. If a thing reflects no light at all, then it's it's black. If it reflects part of the light, it's it's a blue or an indigo or a red. It, if it reflects all the light, then it's white. So we shall seek not to absorb, but to reflect the light of heaven. Thus, we shall become pure and spotless, just like Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 says, with white robes, which the saints will wear in glory. Now, the white robes represent pureness, purity, as these saints are standing before the throne, before the Lamb, in white robes. Now, what are they armed with? They're armed with white, uh, with palm branches, dressed in white robes, armed with palm branches in their hands, the Bible says. Now, where does that take your mind back to? Yes, sir. New Testament. The city of Jerusalem. The, the entry of Christ on a donkey as they wave the palm branches at the Passover as he's walking or riding that donkey through the town and they're waving their palm branches as we'll get to Easter here in just about a month or so. <clears throat> so we have who they are, what they're doing. They're the saints. They're standing. They're robed in white. They're waving palm branches and they're crying out in worship. Now let's talk about this worship right here for a moment. They're crying out. How are they crying? The Bible says that they're crying out loud and they're on their faces. Let me just tell you, some people, according to the way they worship on earth, are going to be in for a rude awakening when they begin to worship in heaven as we bow before the King of kings and Lord of lords. Man, what a glorious sight it will be. You think we have some moments of incredible worship in our services or worship services that you've been a part of. And man, I, I've been a part of those where I just felt like it was heaven coming down. That can't come close to what we will experience. And I got to tell you, folks, it's going to be loud. It's going to be uh, vocal. Our whole body will be involved. It says they were on their faces. They're waving their branches. It's a glorious scene of heaven. So we've seen their nature of the worship. Now, how about their notoriety? Who, who, who are these people? Well, we've already defined that. They're the 144,000, and now the Gentiles that have been saved during the first part of this tribulation. Look at verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these people robed in white, and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know, then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation that they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. 
For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they have served him day and night in his sanctuary. And that refers, that whole couple of verses there is referring specifically to the Gentiles. No longer will they hunger. No longer will they thirst. No longer will the sun strike them or any heat because the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's talk about the notoriety. They will be properly recognized. We saw that in verses 13 through 15 as John talking to this figure they're going to be properly recognized. Then we get to verse 16. They're going to be properly rewarded. No longer will they be hungry. No longer will they be thirsty. No longer will the sun beat, on that, beat down on them. And they'll be given springs of living water. And the God's going to wipe away their tears. They're going to be properly recognized by God to enter. And then they're going to be properly rewarded for what they've gone through. What an incredible scene there. These saints of all time standing with the Savior around the throne, unto the Lamb around the throne of God. What an incredible scene that Revelation chapter 7 depicts for there. Let's move on quickly now. Look at point number three on the screen. I'm calling this the seventh seal of the Savior. Now, two weeks ago, we finished up the sixth seal. Tonight at the beginning, we talked about this pause that has taken place, this parentheses that, that John is, is giving us. When we get to chapter eight, we get back to the seals and we're going to pick up the seventh seal that the Savior is going to open. This, by the way, is event 10. If you're following those um, 50 events of the final days of history, final moments of history, I have that in your sermon sheets for tonight. If you're following that, this event is event 10. In chapter 8 and verse 1, though, let's read these verses, verses 1 through 6. Let's go ahead and read this whole passage again. When, now, kind of given a time frame there, not, didn't use after this, this time, but he did say, now, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of of all the saints on the gold altar in front of the throne. Wow, I'm going to define that for you in just a moment. Explain it to you. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up to the presence of God from the angel's hand. The angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it like throwing a baseball to the earth. And there were thunders and rumblings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. We are getting prepared for the great tribulation. We are anticipating that right now. You hear the verbiage, you hear the words and the language that's being described. Something major is going to happen. Listen, chapter 8, verse 1. There was this silence that John references. Now, that indicates that something great is about to happen. You see that there as he starts describing these events then in verse 2. Let's look at some of those things. First of all, he refers to this golden incense burner. Now, what does a burner do? Think about it for a moment. When, when you light something and it's burning, it spreads light, visual, a sight, and then it gives off a smell. 
an aroma. I, I, I kind of like going into a, a place where a, a, a kitchen where there's pilot lights burning and those pilot lights stay burning. You can smell that ever so faintly. But if you go over and look, you can see the light and you can smell that aroma. That's what's happening right here. It's exactly what happened. Then verse four, this golden incense burner is like the heavenly altar of incense in the tabernacles of the Old Testament. We're preaching on Zechariah right now on Sunday mornings. Hope that you'll join us for that series entitled Fast Forward. But we're talking about some of these things and Zechariah is about to lead the people in the rebuilding of the temple. If we refer back to these Old Testament tabernacles and to the altars and to the temple that's going to be rebuilt by, by Zechariah, you, there, you'll find this kind of language about those altars of incense. Look with me. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1. You are to make an altar for the burning of incense. Make it of Achaia wood. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1. Now look at Psalm 141 verses 1 and 2. Lord, I call on you. Hurry to help me. Listen to my voice when I call you. May my prayer be set before you as incense and the raising of my hands as the evening offering. In the Bible, over and over and over, especially in the Old Testament, prayer is compared to incense. Prayers give an, ants, uh, an atmosphere. Prayers give an atmosphere of a sweet-smelling aroma to God. When you give praise and you give prayer, the Bible says it's as a sweet smelling aroma in his presence. Now, what it's saying right here, boy, I wish we had more time to spend right here. In these verses, verses one through six of chapter eight, all the prayers, get this now, all the prayers of all the people, of all of history. Are you with me? All the prayers of all the people, of all of history, are being gathered and are about to be answered and thrown at the earth. God's kingdom and his will is about to answer all of the prayers of the believers of the history of in this seventh seal. So keep praying. Keep praying. Now, boy, our time is coming to a close. I wish we had more time right here. But the seventh seal now is going to include, where we'll pick up next week, in verse seven, the seven trumpet judgments. So I hope that you'll come back with us next week as we pick up that uh, begin looking at those seven trumpets. Now, let me close with this. As we viewed in chapter seven, that um, environment and that event that's going to take place in heaven, every tribe, every tongue, every peoples, every nations that have accepted Christ as Savior, Jews and Gentiles, can you imagine what that's going to be like? You know, the only thing I've experienced in my lifetime that even gives me a little semblance of what that might be like was two of the most awesome experiences I've ever experienced in my life. First was in 2010 when I went to Africa. We went out to the bush country to a thatch church there and, and before we got there, about a mile or two out, the missionary said, roll down the window. Well, the windows were already rolled down because it's hot. But he said, as you approach, now we're approaching this church. I want you to be quiet. Don't talk among yourselves. I want you to just watch and listen. Well, we knew when the missionary told us that, that there was something significant we were going to experience. And about a mile away, we began to hear what he was talking about. 
They knew we were coming, but they also knew it was the Sabbath day. It was Sunday. It was church time. And they had already gathered, and we could hear their drums playing and their instruments playing and, and them singing loudly as I entered that church, that thatch hut. And, and we began to enter into worship as much as we could. We didn't know the songs, but boy, they were singing in their native tongue. And I was listening and I just began to weep and cry because I thought this must be what heaven is going to be like. Later in my life, I got the opportunity to go to Romania. Then we crossed over into Moldova, and I was preaching in a church in the center town of Kishnel, Moldova, and I was preaching at that church. And before I got up to preach, we were singing. Now, I did a little study uh, while I was there and even asked. Th these people were singing in multiple languages. They were singing in Moldovan, which is the same as Romanian, so that language was being sung out of. They were singing in Russian. They were singing in Ukrainian. They were singing in Bulgarian. And they were singing in English. All these languages singing. Now most, as I remember, were singing in Romanian. Probably about 60% of the culture, culture there in country speak in Romanian. But there were, a matter of fact, they had two different languages on the screens. That day I recognized some of the songs, some of the same songs we sing here in English. And I was able to participate in English. But as I was singing in English, there were people singing in Moldovan and Russian and Ukrainian and Bulgarian. And the languages were being lifted up to the same Jehovah God. What a blessing. The tears were just coming down my face as I stood and sang and looked out. And the, my mind was going to every nation every tribe, every tongue, sing to the same God. What a day that will be. When we gather together for every tribe and every tongue, you know what? Your loved one who may have gone on to be with the Lord, my mom and dad, Brother Archie, Sometimes I, I hear people say, oh, I wonder what they're doing up there. Are they just sitting around in a rocking chair? Are they watching over us? I, I personally do not believe that they can see us. I don't. But you know what? They're not concerned with us. They are around the throne of God. And the scripture tells us here, these saints are busy. They're busy. They're worshiping. They are gathered around the throne of God and, and they're helping do something. They're serving God. That's what they're doing. I don't know what all that means, but the Bible says these saints are serving. One day we'll be there. If you know Christ as Savior. We've got to conclude today. Hope you've enjoyed the study. Join us this coming Sunday morning, 9.15 or 10.30 or right here on the live stream, 10.30. May God bless you. Have a great day and live your life intentionally for Christ tonight.